Welcome to Basketball Network. My name is Harry, and today we'll be talking to Dennis Hobson, all-time leading scorer at Ohio State, third pick of the 1987 NBA draft, and NBA champion with the 1991 Bulls. Dennis, welcome. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Appreciate you having me, and, and, and again, great seeing you again. Great. Um, so let's talk about Ohio State. You are the Big Ten Player of the Year in '87. Mm -hmm. Averaged, you know, you, you had an amazing season. Averaged 29 points uh, your your senior year. Mm -hmm. Broke the record. Um, can you highlight your favorite uh, moment from OSU? You know, I had a lot of them, um, and I think it's hard to just pick the whole scoring, breaking the scoring record because, you know, I, I don't know that anybody has those type of expectations coming into school that they're going after certain records, especially the school's all-time leading score. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing, Harry, or one of the biggest things, man, or biggest highlights, I should say, is, is just having the opportunity, man, to play against – uh, play with a lot of great guys and then play against a lot of great guys. And, you know, a lot of people, they like to comment or talk about me breaking the record. But let me say this, man, without some of the guys that I play with or all the guys that I play with, um, that wouldn't be possible. So, you know, again, we have to share the, the wealth with, um, with other guys that you play with and against because the guys I played with, they allow me to be who I am. And the guys I played against, they challenged me. And, you know, they, they, they kept you on your P's and Q's night in and night out. So, again, it's not um, one thing that I can actually pick, and, you know, but there's there's a lot of things that helped me get to, to, to or allow me to get that record. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, from your freshman year to senior year, you made a big uh, jump. There was a big surge in, um, in your numbers. What was crucial in your uh, development as a player? Uh, I think learning. I, th I think coming out of high school, you know, um, as a freshman at Ohio State, I did get the opportunity to start a lot of games. Uh, but I thought I was patient. Um, I thought the coaches did a nice job of bringing me along slow. Um, I thought that there was a lot. Uh, that I needed to learn about the college game. And, um, you know, as time went on, I felt, you know, areas that I needed to improve in. And once I, once I learned how to do that, once I really concentrated on, on what needed to be worked on, um, you know, watching a lot of film of myself and watching the film of the guys that I've already playing against, um, it, it helped with my growth. And I, I think, you know, when, when Gary Williams came in, Coach Miller got fired after my junior year, and um, I had a good junior year, average 20 points a game. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was, it was um, a little, I was a little nervous because I didn't know who was coming in. But uh, once Gary Williams got the job and, and his style of play, um, it was a no-brainer for me. And, uh, you know, like you said, 20 points went to 29. So the average nine more points a game as a senior – a lot of that had to do with Gary Williams style of play, you know, the full court pressure. And he had me on the top of the ball uh, at the tip of the, at the, at the tip of the press, I should say. So it allowed me to get a lot of easy steals and uh, three point line came into play that year. So I knocked down like 63 threes, I think. Um, so it's just an up tempo style, which gave me the opportunity to, uh, to increase and, 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 and be uh, productive, man, my senior year. Mm -hmm. And when, when talking about the, the, the three-point line, do you think it was a big, um, I guess, did, did the three-point line, the introduction of it, have a big impact on your scoring your senior year, perhaps? I think so. I think so because, you know, I shot a high percentage from three. And like I said, I was able to knock down, I think it was 63 of them that year in one year. So, you know, um, it was one of those things where I, I was able to attack the basket when I needed to. I got a lot of steals. Uh, when we when we were in our pressure defense and, and I was able to step out on the perimeter and um, knock down jump shots as well. So, yeah, the three point line, again, it, I, I thought it was very helpful in my uh, productivity my senior year. Mm -hmm. And then getting drafted to the Nets uh, as the third pick and coming into um, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I guess you could say, a lot of instability with the franchise mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. coming in. A, a lot of coaching changes from Dave Wall to Willis Reed, Bill Fitch. Uh, did that instability in any way affect uh, you as a young player coming in? 
Uh, you know, I can, I can say that had a lot to do with it. Um, I'm, I'm going to say uh, going from Midwest to the East Coast had a lot to do with it. And injuries played a part in that. And um, if I had to do it all over again, I think as a, as a player, overall player, I would have been a lot more selfish. Now, my career, my career average is 10 points a game um, in the time that I was in the league. But I, if I had to do it all over again, just knowing what I know now, I would have been a lot more selfish because, um, you know, taking a back seat like I did as a freshman at Ohio State, it's a little different when you get to the pros, okay? You're, you know, you're drafted to the pros because of your playing ability. And I thought that I um, – I deferred a lot. I deferred a lot. I um, I could have been a lot more aggressive on the on the, on the offensive end, um, but I didn't. I think you know when you're young, you're accustomed to playing team basketball, and um, you know I think that played a lot in in in, in what I was thinking. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, if I had to do it all over again, man, I would have been a lot more selfish. I would have shot the basketball. A lot more aggressive. Man. Yeah, I would have shot the basketball, man. Whenever I had the opportunity to shoot it, I would have shot it. And looking at the game and how it has evolved, you, you would probably get that uh, opportunity much more. And just, mm -hmm. you know, the game being a three-point oriented game right now, mm -hmm. you know, things, are, things have changed a lot. So uh, what do you think was the biggest adjustment uh, you had to make when you, when you turned pro? The speed, the speed of the game, um, the physicality of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you, let me tell you this, when you play in a two position and you're playing a three position, those positions, when you're on defense, you're getting picked and screened a lot because they're trying to get their twos and threes open for shots. Um, so uh, the, the biggest difference from college to the pros was the, the, the quickness of the game and the physicality uh, of the game. Um, and like I said, just learning how to get through screens when one of those big guys were setting screens on you and then on the offensive end, coming off the of screens and not waiting, just coming off, just firing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because the game is so fast. You know, you you got to open shots. You got to take it right away because mm -hmm. the whole close is super, super quick. So those two things, I, I would have to say, was was the biggest difference. And then, you know, when doing my research and checking out um, your stats in college and, and, and the pros, I noticed uh, one thing. Um, it was it was your uh, three-point attempts, uh, especially – uh, in your senior year uh, at Ohio State, I think you had around five, maybe even more than five per game com mm -hmm. compared to your third season uh, with the Nets, which was your best season. You had a bit more than three, uh, sorry, 1.3 or something like that. So um, is it just, you know, the game being different or what was, I guess, um, the reasoning behind this kind of adjustment? Was it just, you know, the coach's decision or how did that work? Well, a couple of things, a couple of things. Uh, one is it, it's all, it's all um, decided on the offense that you're running. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, if you're the plays that you're running, I should say, if you have plays that um, to where you're not getting the three point opportunity, uh, you're going to play inside a three point line. Um, then the other thing, the other thing, Harry was um, the, the distance, the distance, man, that line is, that line is, is way, it's it, from college to, to the pro, that line is a, a big like four, difference. Four man. feet. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, people don't understand. And then the depth, when you're playing those big arenas, you know, it's just kind of wide open. So, you know, what looks like an easy shot is not an easy shot. Um, so, but I think those two things played a factor or played a play mm -hmm. as to why I probably didn't shoot as many in the pros as I did. Mm -hmm. in college because you know again offense depending mm -hmm. on what we're running and then the other thing was the other uh, line yeah especially yeah the, uh, the difference especially i guess in your time when the three-point line got introduced in the nca it was like 19 feet nine inches there you go there yeah you go. It, it, it's a bit it's a bit um i guess longer now mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. a, that's a very big jump to 20 <laughs> to 23 feet nine inches uh that's in right. NBA, so that's right um, and then um, in uh, 1990, you got uh, traded by the Nets to the Bulls for um, a, a couple of first round and second round picks. Mm -hmm. Was was this a surprise for you? And what do you think of your next destination, the Chicago yeah, Bulls? Yeah, it was. It, it was. It, I don't know that it was a surprise. It surprised me. I tell you what happened, man. I uh, me and Bill Fitch, 
we didn't see eye to eye. We didn't get along at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thought that was my best season, like you said, you know, led the team in scoring and um, just getting getting a good feel for the game at that time. So just kind of growing into my own. And for him to trade me um, because of, of the relationship, okay, fine. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But to trade me to Chicago, I wasn't okay with that, okay, because – you know, coming off my best season and leading Jersey and scoring uh, to going somewhere, playing behind the best player uh, to play the game, I wasn't happy. And, you know, I, I never forget the day I got traded. I was at my basketball camp in, here in Toledo. And, um, you know, they came in and told me that I was traded. I had just had surgery on my knee, too. Uh, you have, you've been traded to Chicago, you know, um, a lot of the kids were excited about that at the camp, but I wasn't excited about that because I already knew what the situation was. I watched, mm -hmm. uh, Sam Vincent, yeah, um, go uh, play behind Mike. I watched Sadell three and mm -hmm. it's just, you just don't get the minutes. And again, I just thought why there, you know, you coming off of, uh, averaging 16 points a game, why not allow me to continue my growth? And start uh, somewhere else. Yeah. And start somewhere else. There you mm -hmm. go. And so I was, I was very, very, very not excited about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, like you said, all of a sudden, um, you know, you're playing uh, on a championship contending team, but behind the best player ever to play the game. Uh, did you, when coming in uh, to Chicago, did you ever talk openly to Jerry Krause um, in the Bulls front office about your role uh, with the team? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was, it was said, man, that we would be able to play together a lot um, because Michael would move over to the point guard position. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, we played a couple games together, but no major minutes. Uh, so what was said didn't actually happen. And even when it was said, I didn't believe that it would happen because, you know, BJ was playing, you know, he started playing well and John Paxson was playing well. And those two guys were at the point guard. So at the end of the day, man, it was, it was uh, disheartening to be mm -hmm. traded there. Um, but there was an excitement because I got something out of, out of the trade mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was a championship. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I got to ask you, what was your relationship like uh, with Michael? We, you know, we, we didn't have a bad relationship. I know, you know, some people read the Jordan Rue's book, this and that, but, you know, mm -hmm. Michael actually had given up some money in order to get me there um, mm -hmm. because the salaries were so high at that time and, and they didn't have, uh, the, the they couldn't take over my contract at that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he actually um, uh, gave up some money in order mm -hmm. to get me there. Now, did we go out and, 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 and go to dinner together? No, we didn't do that. But, mm -hmm. you know, on that level, a lot of guys don't do that, you know. Uh, but I had my guys that I was with, you know, Stacey King, B.J. Mm -hmm. Armstrong, uh, Cliff Levingston, mm -hmm. you know, guys that, uh, you know, I still break bread with. And, you know, but it, it, we didn't have a bad relationship. I don't want people to think we had a bad relationship. Mm -hmm. What about Phil, Phil Jackson, the Zen master? Uh, he was a bit unorthodox in his coaching ways. Uh, I'm sure there were, you know, the, there are awesome stories uh, about him in practice and, you know, off the court. Can you perhaps share a few anecdotes about him from that year? Yeah, you know what I liked about Phil? He was different from anybody I had been around uh, because, like you said, he's a Zen master. But more importantly, he's a guy that makes you think. You know, like you, uh, you, you know, he might have you stand in a circle before practice starts and, and close, just close your eyes, you know, close your eyes and, and think about this or think about that. Um, so and I, I had never, ever been around a coach like that. And it's, it's, and it's funny now, um, I do things to kind of, I'm not going to say challenge my guys, but I do things to make my guys think. Uh, and they don't know why I'm doing it. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, again, you take, bits and pieces from, from different people that you've been around and feel, um, again, he, 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 he knew each and every one of his players and he knew, uh, what it took to get the most out of the guys that he were, he was around. And I, and I can appreciate that from, from him. Mm -hmm. I know, um, when, uh, actually Kukoc was, um, was cited saying that, um, Phil Jackson would give each of his players a book. 
mm-hmm. every year and then he would talk to you about the book did this happen with you as well or uh that didn't happen that that yeah. probably didn't happen i know that that was that was talked about during the, the uh, micro slow series he had yeah but no that 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 didn't happen uh he might have gave given us i'm sorry given us some assignments to do but he never, not my group, not when mm-hmm. I was there. I never had a book that I had to read and come back and give like a book report. I've mm-hmm. never had that. <laughs> um, and then um, moving on to uh, Sacramento, um, mm-hmm. in, uh, you, you were traded to the Kings in 91. And again, in a position to prove yourself, I guess they already had an established team. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, you... Played quite a bit that year, but didn't start again. Can you talk about your time in Sacramento? And- I was, it, was, it was the best. It was the best, man, it was because I got back. I got back to being allowed to grow and play. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I never forget. I average eight, well, I know I averaged 18 minutes a game, mm-hmm. and then I averaged like 10 point something a game. You know, so like I was instant offense, you know, getting mm-hmm. the games. And, you know, I played with a great group of guys that they, some of them were young. Then we played with Wayman Tisdale. You know, because Mitch Richmond and Spud Webb had just got traded there mm-hmm. right before I did. Um, so he just it just kind of brought life back to uh to my game when I when I got traded to Sacramento. Um and unfortunately I made a bad move move because I could have been there, but I relied upon my um after that year. Uh, mm-hmm. they wanted to give me another deal another deal. Uh but listening to my agent, um just kind of messed me up a little bit, and that's what caused me to go overseas and play, man. And, got trapped overseas and never tried to come back over this way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was my, my next question. I guess what led to your transition to the mm-hmm. to Europe? So it was um, it was bad advice from your agent? Yeah, I just mm-hmm. had bad advice, man. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing I, I tell kids when I talk to them today, man, man take full take full control over your life, okay? Over your over over the um, the decisions that you make. Don't allow somebody else to make those decisions for you because excuse me being young and uh listening to him i never forget um gary st jean he was a general manager at the time called me hey we got this deal on the table for you you know what do you want to do well i'm waiting and waiting and i'm stalling and i'm stalling because my attorney or my agent was thinking that i could have they could have given me more mm-hmm. but what it would allow me to do <coughs> excuse me what it would allow me to do was become an unrestricted free agent after that contract was up mm-hmm. okay so if i continued to play well then i could have went anywhere exactly. and got another contract okay but waiting around waiting around waiting around they gave the money to vincent ask you gave mm-hmm. to vince ask you but it wasn't like they didn't want me back because they wanted me back and they gave me a lot of time before they moved on so again that was the biggest mistake ever Mm-hmm. that I made uh, in terms of playing in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Because, <coughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't know that story. That's, that's crazy. Um, mm-hmm. Because, I mean, I know in those days, Europe was comparable to, to, to the NBA in terms of salaries. I know, I know in the early 90s that Dino Raja had, had, a, cra- mm-hmm. had a crazy salary in, in, in Italy, a couple of million dollars. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you had um, really good offers in Europe as well. I did, I did, played, I did, and that's what, and that's and you know, and that's what that's what kept me there mm-hmm. because you know they start earlier, so you know and I know the general managers were going to call my my new agent over here in the states and say, hey, this is what we want to pay him, all right, and mm-hmm. I would be a fool to turn that down. Why would I turn something like that down to try to go back and make somebody's in the eighteen? Mm-hmm. I did learn, I will tell you, I did learn at that time, you know what, this is a business. Mm-hmm. You take advantage of the opportunities, you get your money, okay, and then you do whatever after that, okay? And that's what I did. Uh, that's what I did. I, I, was, I wasn't going to make any more dumb decisions like I allow my, uh, my past agent to do when I was out in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. And you played eight years in Europe, in Spain, mm-hmm. France, Turkey, uh, Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some of your maybe favorite moments? Maybe you can highlight one or two uh, in Europe. Oh, man, you know what? It, it, it's funny because those the, the, the places that you mentioned, they were all big-time places. So it wasn't like some of these countries that guys go to. I mean, I felt at home. I was at home. I mean, I, I was able to eat the food, okay, that I was used to. I was able to speak English. 
um, even though I was in a different country because everybody in the different countries that I was in, they spoke English. Mm -hmm. So, hey man, it, now again, and, and you know what the biggest thing was? Is I got I got two things. I got a chance to continue my basketball career. And then I got, a, I got an opportunity to meet a lot of new people, mm -hmm. you know, awesome. and, and, visit, and, be, and be in different countries, you know. So that's something that a lot of Americans can't, can't say, you know. Exactly. I've, I've actually had that opportunity to do some things that a lot of people haven't had the opportunity to do. And I'm mm -hmm. appreciative of that. And what about the fan experience? Uh, just comparing Europe to uh, USA, uh, you know, European fans do tend to get a bit rowdy. Can you talk more about that? <laughs> crazy, man. Crazy, crazy. You know, it was, it was different. Um, love the support. Love the way that they um, uh, accepted the Americans that were over there playing. Um, you know, uh, uh, just like just like people around here love the game. They love the game as well. And actually, they may they might love it even more. You know, they might support even more because they were they were rah rah. You know, cheer. They uh, supported night in, night out. And, and again, I didn't. Hey man, I didn't miss a beat, man. The competition was great. Fan support was great. Um, teammates were great. Couldn't mm -hmm. beat it. Couldn't beat it. I, I checked out your stats in all of those in all of those places. Um, you you averaged twenty plus points pretty much everywhere you played. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which, is, which is quite hard in Europe. I mean, the game is shorter. Um, the spacing is a bit different, um, mm -hmm. I guess. Did you ever think of an NBA co comeback after a couple of successful seasons? Because, you know, those are really, really good stats. I never thought about it. You know, people flirted with me, but nobody could, nobody would give me a guarantee that I was going to be on somebody's roster. So, again, I'm not going to turn down. Again, I thought the whole Sacramento thing set the back of my mind, which – it sits in the back of my mind today when I have to make tough decisions on certain things. And again, I was not going to allow something like that to happen again because I knew why I was in the game. Okay. Now we've been playing this game forever. We've loved this game forever. We've been playing it for free forever, but it got to a point to where I knew why I was in the game and that was to make money. That was my job. Okay. That was my career at that time. So, um, to say I'm going to leave a bunch of money on the table to come back over here and try to make somebody's roster, I'm saying no, and I probably could have made somebody's roster. But at that time, my mindset, again, because of what happened in Sacramento, mm -hmm. was a little different. I just took the guaranteed money and I rolled with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, on to your coaching career, um, who would you say had the biggest influence on your coaching career and I guess why you started to coach? You know, it, it's, that, that's, that's, that's a great question because if you would have asked me back then as a player, did I, did I want to coach? I would tell you, no, I would tell you, no. Okay. But as time went on and I didn't, and I didn't graduate because after we lost to Georgetown and at Ohio state, I quit going to school. So I didn't graduate. So what I did was I went back to school at the age of 40, okay, because I felt once I retired, I think around 34, 35, okay, mm -hmm. uh, I, I felt that I had an opportunity to share a lot of information that a lot of coaches shared with me along my journey as a basketball player and in life as well. So... I went back to school. I was a year and a year and two quarters away from getting my degree. I got my degree, and then I hooked up with Coach Massimino. And Coach Massimino, um, his whole thing was family and love for the game. Um, so again, and I and I'll add one more to 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 me wanting to coach. There's a lot of knowledge, man, that I can share with these kids. Um, again, a lot of basketball knowledge and then a lot of knowledge about life. Uh, and I, I think I, I can reflect back on, even when I was a young kid, you know, outside of my mom, dad, brothers, and sisters, I had the support and love from the city, support and love from the community, support and love from the state. And again, I, I think a lot of that has to do with who I am today. So, um, I'm not going to say it was, it, it, I, you know, I was, I wanted to coach because of that, but a lot of, a lot of reason, reasons as to why 
I'm coaching today is because I got so much inf- I got so much basketball knowledge I can share with these kids that's playing the game of basketball. And then I got so much I can share about life when they leave the university, mm-hmm. you know, so. And give back again, to the community. And, yeah. yeah, I'm going to give back because it was given to me. So, again, I want to give it back. And I would feel that I was cheating a lot of people because I run a big AAU uh, program as well outside of just coaching here. I would think that I was cheating a lot of people because I got so much inside to share. But if I didn't share with anybody, then I would be cheating a lot of people and I would be cheating myself and it wouldn't be fair to me. And it makes sense. And and you mentioned Coach Mess. Um, He was such a great guy. Rest in peace. Uh, uh, I remember those barbecues uh, (laughs) when we would come to his house and then all of a sudden, you know, Chuck Daly's (laughs) in the house. Those, those were some great times. Um, can you perhaps share, you know, I guess a few things you, 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 can, you took away from um, uh, Coach Massimino or I guess ways he impacted your, co- your coaching career? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think Mass, is, Mass kept his family. You just touched on it. He kept his family and he preached family. Uh, and, and let me tell you something. The, the biggest thing uh, that, I, that, I, that I'm, I'm going to take away from me connecting with Coach Mass was when I told you I went back to school at the age of 40 and I graduated at 41, Ohio State was going to the final four, okay? So I was in line getting my tickets for the final four, okay? And Coach Massimino was in front of me. I recognized him, he recognized me. We started talking, one thing led to another. And I told him what my vision was. I told him that, hey, I just graduated from Ohio State. Uh, I'm looking to get into coaching. He says, well, I might have a position for you, okay? I just started a program down in Florida, a small program, and um, I might have something for you. What I loved about that whole conversation, Harry, he gave me his personal cell phone number, man. Mm-hmm. And it, it's kind of, it, it, it meant a lot to me because every time I called him, okay, if he didn't answer that telephone, all right, I left a voicemail, he was going to call me back quick, all right? Talked to him, man. A week later, he flew me down to Florida, and he hired me on the spot. Okay, mm-hmm. so my and, and so that that's something that I would never ever forget about him because I look at situations now, man. And the coaches in the game today, they're completely different from what they used to be. These guys in the game today, man, you know how tough it is if you want to be a college coach. You know how tough it is to get in, mm-hmm. even if you got a good relationship with somebody that's a head coach somewhere. Mm-hmm. These guys, man, are so fickle and funny and insecure mm-hmm. to where it's very, very difficult to get in. So, again, Coach Mass, we knew each other, okay, because of me playing and because of him being a coach. But the biggest thing I took away from that was, man, you know, he allowed me an opportunity to where I know some people at my own university. They didn't, you know, the coaching staff there, they didn't allow me the opportunity. Mm-hmm. So, uh, again, man, um, he had to be one of the most influential guys um, that I've come in contact with in regards to uh, coaches through along my journey as a player and uh, as a coach. Mm-hmm. Such a great guy, great personality. Yeah. yeah gotta love him. Um, after after uh, Northwood, you went to Bowling Green State where you spent five years. Uh, can mm-hmm. you can you talk about your experience uh, there? Yeah, great, great, great place, man. You know, that's 20 minutes from my house. Um, I appreciate Lewis Orr for allowing me the opportunity to work with him for five years. Uh, mid-major basketball, you know, University of Toledo, Eastern Michigan, Western Michigan, mm-hmm. Central Michigan, schools like that. And, um, you know, again, Coach Mass taught me a lot, okay, that I took away, that I implement in what we do today here at, at, um, at Lords. And then Coach Orr, he taught me a lot that I took away, that I implement here at Lords University. So, again, um, the growth is there because I had that opportunity to work with a couple good guys, uh, two different personalities, which was okay, because at the end of the day, man, it's, it's, it's the opportunity somebody allowing you the opportunity, okay? And then more importantly, you learning from the opportunity that you get. So mm-hmm. uh, spending five years at Bowling Green, man, was was great. Um, unfortunately, it didn't last for us. 
uh, they let us go. Um, but hey, man, you know what? Things happen in the mm-hmm. game of basketball. You just take it, you deal with it, and you move on. Mm-hmm. And that's where I am today. Mm-hmm. And I guess uh, just looking at your resume, you, know, you really enjoy enjoy being uh, home in, in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of made an unexpected move uh, when when going to Bedford uh, High School. What was the reasoning behind that? Uh, I mean, because when, when when looking when looking at you know coaches and coaching positions and uh, I guess that, that entire arena, all of them are trying to go up, you know, divi- mm-hmm. you know, and and you made the opposite um, the opposite mm-hmm. choice. Mm-hmm. It, um, um, interview once we got fired, or even when, when I was there, like my fourth year at at. Um, Bowling Green, all right, you're always trying to find or stay ahead of the curve, I mm-hmm. should say. So, you know, interview with a couple of schools at the head coach and small, you know, small schools in, on a college level. Um, couldn't couldn't land any of the jobs. I thought I had one, but somebody beat me out for that one, but couldn't land anything. So, um, I, you know, the high school piece came open. And here, if you if you love something, okay, like doesn't I love matter, it, it doesn't basketball. matter where it is. Yeah. It, don't, it don't matter where it is, you know. And that's 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 the first thing that I pointed out to them when I when I when I took that job. It's like, hey, now I don't have a grandson playing here. I don't have a nephew. I don't have a son playing here. I don't know anybody on this team. I right? it's just the the fact that I love kids and I love the game of basketball. Okay, mm-hmm. so to answer your question the levels never came into play or never crossed my mind when I took that job at Bedford. Okay. Now the reason for me only spending one year there at Bedford was because the commitment wasn't like my commitment. Okay. Um, And it's, it's a situation to where you got an African American guy coaching white kids you know, and I'm stern and I'm getting on them and I'm, 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 I'm aggressive. You know, I'm not going to put my hands on anybody, but I'm going to coach you hard. I'm going to coach mm-hmm. you hard. I don't think that they were ready for that. Okay. Mm-hmm. They weren't ready for that. So I can see where they were. Okay. As a group. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know what? I can't come back here the following year because I your passion is not, your passion is not where my passion is. Your commitment is not where my commitment mm-hmm. is. So it was best that hey, I stepped down and I moved on. And that's what mm-hmm. I did. I stepped mm-hmm. down, I moved on. I uh, wished them nothing but luck. And um, I'm doing what I do. Mm-hmm. And actually, one of the kids that I coached here at Bedford, he plays for me now. He's on, mm-hmm. he's on my team here at Lourdes. Okay. He's a senior this year. And he was an all-league player last year. And, and, and what about Lourdes? What are your goals and ambitions here? Goals here is, is to, to uh, take a group of guys and continue to build this program Okay, um, no pressure, all right? It's just, I want high character kids, okay? I want to prepare them for the game of basketball, teach them the game of basketball. More importantly, I want to prepare them for life when they leave Lord's University, okay? Mm-hmm. Because like I tell them all the time, hopefully you're going to live a lot longer than you play the game of basketball. That's just what it is. I mean, you look at me, you played it, okay? You're still living. Uh, I played it, still living. Um, so at the end of the day, you want to be a product, productive citizen mm-hmm. as you journey through life, man. So again, um, having the opportunity to give back um, basketball knowledge and give back um, life experience um, to kids, man, it's, 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 it's where my passion is, where my heart is. That's amazing. Uh, right, coach, and we like to we like to end uh, all of our interviews with a few quick fire questions. So, just really short answers. Um, best teammate you ever played with? Curtis Wilson. Um, most underrated player in the league right now? Uh, Draymond Green. Um, toughest matchup, your nemesis, your nemesis when you were in the league? Michael Jordan. Uh, the GOAT? Michael Jordan. Uh, the best shooter ever? Uh, Seth Curry. Uh, all-time starting five? Uh, Michael Jordan. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and LeBron James. Wow, that's a hell of a team. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, best international player of all time? Um, that I played with or against? I, I guess, yeah, I mean that too, but I guess of all time. Any, you know, anybody? Uh, Sabonis. Can... Sabonis. Yeah, he came to the league pr pretty late. He would have been a beast mm -hmm. if he came earlier. Mm -hmm. um, a favorite NBA team growing up? The Lakers. The Lakers. Yeah. Uh, Olympic gold or NBA ring? NBA ring. And um, the Lakers versus the Heat in the finals. Who's going to take Lakers. it? Lakers. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to ask you this one. One-on-one uh, -on -one with Michael, you ever played and how it went? <laughs> uh you said that, how would it go yeah how would it go one on one we would challenge each other mm -hmm. i'm not gonna back down i don't care mm -hmm. no matter what we will always challenge each other now who will win who knows yeah you're you're but it would be very competitive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's awesome uh okay coach that's uh that's it thank you for your time it's been a pleasure catching up with you appreciate it wish you all the best at lords take care man best of luck to you as well all right